Um, so thanks for the invitation to speak this evening. Um, you're talking about strangles. So uh, I guess one of the things I'm, I'm, I've had a look at the who's uh, um, the participants here, and there's a number of people who probably know heaps about strangles. And so I apologise if this is a little bit uh, too low level in terms of your knowledge base. Um, but I wanted to make sure we brought everyone along with us. So um, strangles is one of the uh, most commonly diagnosed infectious diseases of horses around the world. Um, it's ubiquitous in pretty much every horse population, except if you're fortunate enough to go to Iceland, uh, where Icelandic horses don't have strangles because they haven't imported horses into Iceland for more than a thousand years. Um, but pretty much irrespective of breed, use, age, uh, any, any sort of other variable you'd like to throw in there, uh, all horses get strangles. And unfortunately, I think it's the disease we've sort of learned to live with but it's also the disease we don't talk about. And so there's a stigma associated with strangles. And I think it's very unfortunate because people then tend to brush things under the carpet a little bit. Um, and also I think I've heard um, people in the horse industry, veterinarians as well, talk about strangles as being, you know, oh, something that, that uh, all horses get when they're, when they're young enough and, and they just get it and they get over it and they move on. And I just think I'd, I'd just like to remind people of two things. So. If anyone's ever had a pimple, I'm sure everyone's had a pimple. Those big pimples that you know um, come up in, in get full of pus and they and they hurt. Um, and as, if anyone's ever had uh, swollen lymph nodes uh, and they hurt as well, imagine if the pimple was a bigger abscess and it was inside the swollen lymph node, how much that would hurt if it then just burst outside through the skin. So that's where I'm coming to uh, you with where we talk about strangles. I actually think there's a welfare issue associated with horses getting strangles. Um, particularly when they get the more severe forms of the disease. Um, I think as an industry, we tend to try and manage the cases, we tend to manage the outbreaks, um, but we're not really thinking about the whole of the disease when we think about strangles. And so um, I know that some people's idea of managing the cases is just to pop them back out into the spelling paddock and wait for them to get over it. Uh, and that's fine, but the problem is that a certain proportion of them are gonna, get, uh, are gonna go on to become carriers and perpetuate our problem into the future. Um, they kick you out of the microbiology union if you don't put a picture up of the particular agent that you're talking about. So um, we're talking about streptococci here. So they're little um, gram-positive uh, balls, cocci in chains. And so you can see the chain here in the middle. Um, and there's two different types of, or two particularly important streps in uh, horses. One strep equi, subspecies equi, which is an obligate pathogen of the horse, so you don't find it growing pretty much anywhere else. And the other strep zoopidemicus, okay, and it's uh, an opportunistic bacteria. Um, strep zoopidemicus will cause disease that looks like strangles, but tends not to get transmitted from horse to horse to horse as strangles does. So it's really important to differentiate between the two of them. Um, I got some nice photos. These are, of course, no one shows photos of mild disease. Um, these are some of the more spectacular photos that I could find in my travels looking at uh, uh, strangles. And so, um, but you can see here the, I wonder if you can see my, my pointer, but anyway, even if you can't, you can certainly see the, the large swollen lymph nodes that are in here in and around the throat, uh, in, the, in the throat latch sort of area, the submandibular lymph nodes there, and you can see the hairs starting to fall off some of them and, and, the, and they're about to burst. And in that, there's lots of pus. And in the past, there's lots of bacteria, and that's pretty much how it gets spread from horse to horse, right? So in, in the in the pus, if you're thinking about uh, the environment that favours bacterial replication, pus is a pretty good one. I borrowed some slides. I borrowed uh, some slides from the Strangles Awareness Week. So in the UK, there, there's um, they, they, I quite like the um, Red Wings uh, Horse Sanctuary and some of the other um, groups in there. That they, they take strangles very, very seriously. After they had a big outbreak on one of the um, on one of the farms that that, that uh, Red Wings operates, one of the sanctuary uh, properties, and so that they've got a coalition, British Horse Racing, uh, the British Horse Society, and a whole bunch of other groups have got together to talk about strangles to try and destigmatize it a little bit. Um, and they put together some nice slides, so I've, I've borrowed a couple of them for tonight. Um, so when they talk about, you know, we've talked about strep equi, it's spread from horse to horse, uh, indirect and direct contact. So you, if you've got it on yourself and you go from an infected horse to an in, uninfected susceptible horse, you can transmit the bacteria to them on just on your hands, on head collars, uh, other pieces of equipment, stuff like that. Um, 
they talk about low mortality but high morbidity risk. This can go very quickly through a group of susceptible horses um, and the bacteria can persist in the environment for a reasonable amount of time. Apparently my screen sharing is paused. Can, Charmaine, can you still see? Yes, I can. Okay, that's good. That wasn't paused too much then. Um, so they talk, these are some of the, the um, clinical signs that you'll see in horses that have strangles. So it could just be a sudden fever, depression, nasal discharge. Nasal discharge is really common. Um, anorexia, so that's just the, the animal not eating, dysphagia, large swollen lymph nodes that are painful to touch and they'll abscess and they'll burst. And some of the pus that will burst out through the skin, but other um, abscesses, particularly the retropharyngeal ones, which are the, the lymph nodes at the back of the throat, can actually burst into the guttural pouch. Uh, and that's where you, the, the uh, beginnings of our problems with carrier animals. Um, or the, the name comes from the fact that when these uh, retropharyngeal lymph nodes get really big, they can actually start to occlude the trachea and you do see he, um, horses can die from asphyxiation. Here's another slide I borrowed from uh, Josh Slater, who works at the University of Melbourne as well, but um, was when he was at, in uh, the Royal Vet College. And I think this is part of, this goes to the, um, the notion where we don't talk, we, we don't talk about strangles, um, or when we do, it's in a quite a damaging sort of way, um, because it tends to be on social media. We've been, uh, the Centre for Equine Infectious Disease at the University of Melbourne, uh, where I work, has been called in to manage a number of different outbreaks on adjustment properties um, and other um, businesses where there's, you know, up to 100, 120 horses, 80, 90 different owners, four or five vet clinics all in, on, involved with the horses on the property. Um, and the social media storm that surrounded that was quite impressive. Um, it was a problem. There was all sorts of people trying not to um, let people know that they were involved with uh, this particular property and they weren't allowed to move their horses off and all sorts of problems. So I think the more we talk about this disease, uh, the easier it is going to be to, for us to be able to control it. Um, this slide's from Andrew Waller, and I think it's the nice sort of um, way that these horses, you can see how this um, gets spread from horse to horse. These are horses, you've got their nice nasal discharge there. You can see they've got clinical signs. Um, when we're trying to manage an outbreak, we identify the horses that are in contact with the horses with the clinical signs and the horses that have had no contact with the horses that have got clinical signs. Okay. Hey, and Sally. then. Sorry, it's Annalise here. Your, um, your slides appear not to be moving. Do you, would uh -huh. you like to um, stop sharing and reshare? You stop sharing and I'll reshare. Thank you. How's that? Is that better? We look like we've got it now. Outbreak management, is that the one you're on? That's the one. On the money, there you go. Sorry about that. Okay, so like I said, we, we've got the horses with uh, the, the clinical signs, the nasal discharge, the horses that are in contact with them and the horses that have had no contact with them. And so really what we try and look at is we can move horses from green to get to amber, amber to red, but we try not to go back the other way. And I think, we advise personnel and staff that if they have to handle horses in different groups, that they handle the, the, the green group first, then go to the amber group, then go to the red group. But ideally, we would have different people and different piece, um, pieces of equipment and what have you handling, you know, being involved with the different groups. Um, we need to monitor, oh, that's the equipment, um, we need to monitor the animals that have been in contact with the ones with clinical signs. And when you can see there, once they start to spike a fever, we can move them off and pop them into the in-contact group. So that's Andrew's nice, quick, easy sort of uh, to visualise um, outbreak management slide. This is actually the one we do use. Um, it's a little bit more complicated, but it's essentially the same thing. Uh, so rather than relying on um, people taking rectal temperatures twice a day, we'll segregate them into groups based on whether they've had clinical disease or not, um, whether they've been exposed to horses with clinical disease or not, and then we start to do antibody testing to see whether they've been exposed previously or not. And if they're antibody negative and they stay antibody negative, then it's back to business as usual. If they um, they go antibody positive, then we can put them into the higher risk group. And just and the nice thing about this has been we've been able to predict um, prior to them actually breaking with clinical disease, and so we've been able to sort of um, reduce the number of horses that get exposed. Uh, and then eventually to, to get them back out to business as usual, uh, we took about um, nasopharyngeal swabs and trying to see whether any, any of the horses are shedding. 
And I keep coming back to the business as usual because it tends to be the outcome that people are interested in. They want to be able to go back to Pony Club. They want to be able to continue to breed their horse or take their horse to an event or trail riding or what have you and have the that sort of social media quarantine on the farm lifted. Okay. And and uh, so we've been assisting them in doing that. We identify and isolate any infectious horses. We try and clear the horses in the green group. Um, if possible, we'd remove the horses that have had clinical signs to a different property. Um, and once we can sort of establish sort of that green, amber, red sort of traffic light system, um, we'll wait and treat the clinical cases, wait till they or let them resolve. Um, but again, we're not really dealing with the carriage state here. It's the carrier state. So we've, we know we've got horses that have had strangles. We know that some of those horses will go on to become carriers. But if you're thinking about just getting back to business as usual, once the disease is resolved, then um, people people are less keen for us to come out and continue to investigate their their uh, strangles outbreak. So I guess again with the, the the borrowed slides, there's different stages of strangles. You got the healthy horse coming into contact with the horse or the, with the bacteria incubating for several days, just a couple of weeks, uh, several weeks. Usually a fever before the horse is infectious, become clinically ill and they'll go on and resolve. They may look like a healthy horse and some of those horses will certainly not become carriers, but a certain proportion of them will. And, and that's the problem that we've got. Um, it's just, most strangles carriers have got pus in their guttural pouches during infection. They're not clearing it. Um, they're getting chondroid formation and they can still shed the bacteria. And so hopefully, oh, sorry, this was, that was rosy, uh, the Clydesdale there, but anyway, um, they produce antibodies, but not all the time and not for long periods either. So um, if you'll bear with me, I've got a quick video, which I quite like. Okay, so hopefully that wasn't overly simplified for you, but I do think I, I liked it. I, it. It sort of sums up everything that you need to know about strangles carriers. The problem we've got is the estimate around the proportion of horses that go on to become carriers varies. And so some um, papers in the literature talk about 10% of recovered horses become carriers. 
Um, it's been 40% in, in a recent study. I think it depends on how recently they've had the infection or how long it's been since they, since they became infected or the guttural pouch became infected. And the questions I've got are, is this, is this true in Australia? So both of those um, were studies that were done overseas. Um, does the rate vary in different circumstances? How long do they stay as carriers? Does the rate vary with the prevalence of previous infection? Um, does the strain of bacteria that we have in Australia alter the likelihood of carriage? And the answer I've got to all those is I'm not sure. And hence the reason that we applied for, to AgriFutures to do some research in this. So the question we're basically asking is what sort of risk do carrier horses pose to the Australian thoroughbred industry? Um, we've proposed to do some serological screening. So determine the seroprevalence on different thoroughbred enterprises, breeding, racing, spelling. We also thought we'd try and get some samples from non-thoroughbred horses and see what the situation was like there as well. Um, with the aim of if they've got antibodies to strep equi, then they've obviously been infected previously. Um, we determine if they're carrier horses, we can do a guttural pouch lavage and uh, look for the bacteria in the guttural pouch. We can also do some nasopharyngeal swabs and see whether they're shedding the bacteria as well in the absence of any obvious clinical signs. Um, and so we're trying to get some sort of uh, evaluation of the risk and the risk factors associated with carriage. Uh, I guess one of the nice things to be able to do as well is to look at the DNA sequence uh, comparison of uh, isolates from the various horses with strangles and look at outbreak strains versus carriage strains and, and also to try and compare it with some uh, bacteria from overseas. So uh, we'd also like to have, be able to have a look at and see whether we can, if there's a, a better way or a preferred method for treating carriers. That's our sort of long-term goal as well. Um, just on the bacteriological studies, um, Annalise suggested that I could put some, so instead of being uh, low tech, I could put some high tech stuff in it toward the end. So we're getting toward the end. So here it is. We um, got together all of our strangles isolates and um, sent them off to some colleagues in the United Kingdom and they've done some sequencing work. So whole genome sequencing. Um, Andrew Waller is the, the colleague who did the, the, the lion's share of the work and he comes up with some very nice titles. So his title was Globe Trotting Strangles, the Unbridled National and International Transmission of Streptococcus Equi Between Horses. Um, and it's a pretty big paper, 760, uh, 670, sorry, uh, Equi isolates, 56 different authors, um, 29 different institutions from 19 countries. You can see the map here with all of the, the different isolates and the different countries are coloured different colours. And so you see in Australia, we're a nice wattle yellow. Uh, I thought that was very appropriate. And this is where they all line up. Uh, it's, in some ways, it's a little bit like the COVID testing that's being done at the moment. They're looking at the, the genome to try and see whether they can link cases, okay? Um, and so I know realise that people can't really see all of the, the different colours in any sort of great detail. So I pulled out a couple of the, the different um, clades, they're, they're BAPS, um, Bayesian Associated Population Surveillance. Um, I think that's what it stands for. But anyway, you can see here our nice little wattle yellow Australian isolates, um, just because we're there across the ditch and the eastern part of Australia, uh, the, the Kiwis are here. Uh, they're quite closely related to ours. But interestingly here, these are a few isolates from the UAE, so from Dubai. Uh, similarly, that's sort of same phenomenon here. You can see the Argentinian isolates in light blue and interspersed amongst them are some isolates from Dubai. Uh, and I think what that's saying to us is that uh, in, in Dubai is a hub, you know, lots of horses travel through Dubai and they've had lots of problems with strangles in their quarantine system because we tend to send them horses uh, that look quite normal, but are actually carriers and they come into contact with other horses as they're in the flight or what have you, and they get outbreaks of strangles in, in the quarantine station, which puts a big problem um, in their lab. Uh, just so it's not just us sending uh, this bacteria around the world. You can see it happens in Europe as well, where there's been a bit more free movement of horses. Um, these are the ones for the red ones are the UK. You've got the Netherlands in here. You've got Sweden in the darker purple, back to the Netherlands, that's Ireland. These ones here are Germany. And if you have a look at the German isolates tend to cluster quite closely together, but they're related to the ones from the Netherlands and they're all related to ones from, that started off with this one here from the UK and they've sent it around the UK. Ireland and the rest of Europe. So I think what we can say quite um, confidently is that um, this bacteria travels quite nicely around the world. I've been asked previously how fast does equine influenza travel and my answer to that was 60 kilometres an hour in a built up area and 110 on the freeway. Strangles travels a lot faster because it goes on an aeroplane, it goes a lot further um, and it's much more difficult to detect. 
Um, I think this was a really nice comment that I, I liked from the, the Strangles Awareness Week. 37% of owners whose horses had had strangles did not know whether their horse was a carrier. Um, people have had their horses for many, many years um, and then found out subsequently that they were carriers. I think uh, our business as usual approach aims to minimise losses associated with outbreaks, but we're ignoring the carrier state and we're perpetuating the problem. It's a prickly issue, but uh, I think it's one that we have to grasp, even if we have to wear appropriate PPE. Um, just to say that uh, this is not a project that I'm doing by myself. There's a team of people at the University of Melbourne. Steve Dennis is uh, doing his PhD. He's going to do most of the hard yards in this. Kim Jeffers, Charlie Alhaj, Joe Allen, Kirsten Bailey, Laura Harderfelt, Carol Hartley, um, and the rest of the team at the Centre for Equine Infectious Disease. So thank you very much. Thank you, James. Now we do have one question here from Mark, who says, hey, James, excellent presentation. As we normally buy a combined tetanus strangles booster shot, consequently, can you over-vaccinate for tetanus? How often would you recommend vaccinating for strangles if you have a horse which is constantly mixing with horses with unknown vaccination statuses? I think I've got that. Yep, so I'm not particularly concerned about over-vaccinating for tetanus. I'd much rather um, appear to over-vaccinate for tetanus than under-vaccinate for strangles. And I think you summed it up very well when you talk about horses that are mixing with other horses of unknown vaccine status or unknown immunological status. So I think from all horses should be vaccinated against tetanus without question. But I also think that if you've got horses that mix at you know, events or trail rides or wherever you're using your horse, then I think the manufacturer's recommendations are every six months that you should be vaccinating your horse. But um, I'll, I can look into that a bit more and make sure that that's correct, but that, that's pretty much my re re recollection. And we have, thank you, James. We have a few more questions coming through now. Um, uh, one from Matt saying, hi, James, how effective is the Strangles vaccine? Is it a good route for erad uh, to eradication? Sorry. Um, it's it's registered to reduce the severity and duration of disease. Okay. Um, and so, and I'm pretty confident that it does that. It, the, the animals that are vaccinated tend to get less sick, but they get sick and they tend to be sick for a less period of time, but they still get sick, right? And they're still able to transmit the bacteria. So I think it's not, um, the effectiveness of this vaccine is not anywhere near the effectiveness of the COVID vaccines. And we can see from the modeling that's being done around that, that we're unlikely to achieve eradication based on just on vaccination alone, right? So um, I think there's there's some, probably some vaccines that are coming on, hopefully uh, being registered in Europe coming in, in, the, in the near future uh, that, that might be able to provide us with more targeted um, better protection in a more targeted way, but let's wait and see. My, my crystal ball is not always what it should be. Thank you. Uh, we have a few more. Uh, we have one from um, a viewer here. James, the bacteria causing strep throat in horse are the same as that causing strangles? Yeah, I think so. Uh, I, strep throat is, tends to be what we would refer to the disease in people, so that's strep pyogenes. Um, but uh, if they're very, if, so strep pyogenes and strep equi are similar but different. But the, um, I think if we're talking about in horses, then yeah, that we would, yeah, would get a, a strep throat. The, there's some, sometimes you'll see a, a pneumonia with Streptococcus suipidemicus, but it tends to be an individual, like an individual horse rather than something that spreads through um, the herd as quite as uh, quickly and with, uh, with as much efficiency as strangles will. Perfect. And we have one more um, now from Julie. What is the situation regarding ailment of state-based regulations regarding reporting of strangles and any other codes slash compliance requirements that might need lining up around Australia to support research? Um, and just further to that, support implementation of the research recommendations for management and treatment. I think there's probably... Um... So from a code type of uh, point of view, if you think about the racing industry around Australia, the rules of racing, the Australian rules of racing will talk about uh, notifying um, infectious disease uh, occurrences to the stewards. 
um, but that's something that's a little bit outside my area um, of, of any sort of influence. But that, that's that's the um, the requirement from there. In terms of state legislation, it's strangles is notifiable in some states. It's notifiable to the chief veterinary officer in Victoria, uh, and I'm not sure which other states. But it's it used to be, but it is no longer in New South Wales. And um, uh, Ben might be able to tell us, but it's it's I don't think it is in Queensland any longer either. But um, even in New South Wales, even in uh, Victoria, where it's notifiable, the DPI tends to say thank you for notifying them, and there's no real um, state mandated quarantine or anything like that. They just like to know where the where the bacteria is. Okay, um, I think that's. Uh, so I think Julie's kind of just talking in here now, saying so. Yeah. I hope your work should be notifiable. Um, but yeah, I think that's more a statement than a question. Yes. Yeah. Um, and Ben said, not that I'm aware to answer your question. Yeah, I, I, I don't think it is. And I, I don't think it, it's ever been. I think it was New South Wales and Victoria that it was notifiable. But it's not in, in New South Wales anymore. 